dull buildings, dim light of rusty street lamps, a sign covered with thick layer of dust, everything was slightly distorted in the growing puddle in front of me. It was raining pretty heavily, but I was too exhausted to hurry. As I got close to the puddle, I saw the trembling silver light of the crescent moon reflected in it. I suddenly stopped, gazing into the deep night sky, as unclear images unexpectedly appeared in my thoughtless mind. That lovely reflection reminded me of something. Just like now, a puddle was in front of me, reflecting moonlight. It was just another boring day as a strange shadow appeared from around the corner of a building, looking like a cat with two tails. I quietly chuckled. Maybe something like this would lighten up my monotonous routine today? Suddenly two purple thunders hit the ground. Just immediately torrential downpour began. Noise of heavy raindrops hitting the ground was overwhelming, everything blurred. My clothes instantly got completely soaked. I run as fast as I could until I finally found a shelter. A bridge crossing the river. It was absolutely immense, hundreds of people could hide under it. But I was afraid there are no civilized people this late, they're only bunch of creeps. Probably it's even safer to be in the middle of a thunderstorm than under that bridge. I wiped my eyes with wet hand, it didn't help. Almost blinded, I ran down the soggy path leading to the river. I didn't even notice how I stepped off the wet ground onto the slippery concrete, but I was about to fall. Clumsily spinning my arms and shuffling my feet, I somehow stabilized myself and slowly walked under the bridge. Only there I noticed I'm trembling. So sea cold. Small puddle appeared underneath me, it was dripping of my clothes. I looked around, there was no one here. No one, only me rushing flow of the river and murmuring noise of continuing downpour. I rubbed my hands together trying to warm myself up. Then I carefully took off my shoes to pour the water out of them. Put my shoes back on myself afterwards. Spooky place. Even in the darkness I could see a dense grid of webs hanging above me on the rough ceiling, like frozen parachutes. A huge shadow slid across the right side as a car drove over the bridge. Such intense downpours don't last for too long. I will leave this place soon. Next five minutes I was simply staring at the river, at its fastened flow, when rain finally stopped. I slightly raised my head and saw some weird movement on the other side. My heart dropped. I stared blankly into the shadows, hoping it was just someone I hadn't noticed hiding from the downpour. A distant hunched silhouette became clearly visible in the darkness, it walks towards the road on the other side. I sighed in relief, it looks like a normal human. Until it suddenly looked at me. Their eyes were glowing like bright neon signs. Left one was dark blue, deep as an ocean, right one was bright green like toxic acid. It stared into my soul. Mine was screaming run, but my body was paralyzed. I couldn't move a single muscle. That horrifying creature, like a giant spider, climbed the uneven ceiling and rapidly, in big spurts, was moving towards me over the river. I lost my last chance to escape. The creature was so close it could reach me with a single leap. But it stopped right in front of me, hanging on the ceiling and silently staring at me. After intense I contest the creature made an odd sound similar to whistle but deeper and quieter. Right after this, two similar creatures jumped out of the water, surrounding me. From close up, they were hard to mistake for humans. They had two arms, two legs and a head, but these are the only similarities. Long and slender fingers, with blade-sharp claws at the tips, rough skin as black as coal, gleaming fangs that can tear apart anything. I am prey. Defenseless and very convenient prey. But instead of attacking and fiercely tearing me apart to make a decent dinner out of me they were just staring. Then the one on the ceiling jumped off, whereupon the other two stood beside him. Then the smallest one of all nodded to me, in a very human way, as if it was saying follow us. I don't think I have a choice. I tentatively took a step towards them, 
and they led the way forward. I couldn't get my mind around what had happened. I'm following some darkling creatures, appeared from nowhere and unnoticed by anyone. Frantic thoughts chaotically popped into my head one after another, but they all boiled down to one thing. I was scared, but excited in a weird way. For the first time in a big, big while. Where could they have come from? In a town a hundred kilometers from here, a mysterious nuclear accident happened seven years ago, but significant amounts of radiation didn't spread that far, due to a swift response of working personnel. But still some strange things happened there for a while, mutated animals, babies born without ears. But nothing is close to big humanoid spiders with glowing eyes. Suddenly two of them stopped and held out their clawed hands to me. Now I was sure, they are not going to kill me. But I had no idea what to expect. What will happen when I touch them? What will happen in a minute? I gingerly held out my hands to them, feeling their rough, almost sharp skin. They tightly held me and jumped. Jumped unimaginably far and high, into a wooded area nearby. I felt a sweeping, cool breeze gently wafting me around. I feel so free. We landed softly and quietly. I noticed that their feet were kind of sinking into the ground a little bit. They are like... Ghosts! That's how I will call my new companions from now. Ghosts, rounding the trees, ran as fast as lightnings, leaving behind themselves a bizarre light tail. I didn't stay behind. I was following them, and then began to notice many many glowing eyes in the dark, more ghosts. We sped up and time slowed down. The moonlight suddenly brightened as a huge flashlight, hearing and vision sharpened. We abruptly stopped and ghosts began to gather around us as if it was some arcane ritual. They held hands all together, forming a ring, and then they looked up, straight at the shining moon. Ghosts swirled in an undulating, elusive dance, and I with them, as if trying to reach the moon. I could feel the moon getting closer, getting bigger, I could reach it with my hand, like all the ghosts here. Unity with the night with these mysterious creatures was just miraculous. I couldn't dream of more in my entire life. Couldn't feel any more free, happy, and fulfilled. Then now, mindlessly twirling in an arcane dance, charmed by the beauty of the night. As I felt the penetrating touch of the sky, the soft touch of the moon and its brightening silver light, something kicked me out of heaven. Pain. Horrible pain running through my entire body. I cautiously looked down at myself. Terror immediately gripped me as I saw disgusting black creatures reaping out my skin as hungry predators. They bared their gleaming fangs to me, from which slowly dripped dark blood, and continued their meal. A scream burst out of me, but it was stuck in my throat. I couldn't move a single remaining muscle. I couldn't utter a sound. All I could do was watch huge spiders eat me alive piece by piece. Smallest one gnawed furiously on my arm, shattering my bones with immense power. The one whom I met the first was drenched in blood after devouring both of my legs. The third one was slowly gnawing through my stomach. Every single movement of their fangs reverberated with unbearable pain. Every time they bit me, I thought I'm going to die in a moment. But unfortunately, I was staying alive, in a cage of my own terror and their powerful grip. My eyes fogged up, the puddle of blood beneath me is growing even larger, this time pain was so intense I stopped feeling it. I couldn't even breathe anymore. This is the end. Almost. The smallest one slightly lifted up and opened its jaws in front of my face. I felt his slimy saliva mixed with my blood dripping down on me. I felt his urge to devour me. Kill me, I suddenly uttered a hoarse scream. But instead, he slowly approached me, it felt like an eternity. I was desperately wishing to die before the next wave of pain, before the next torture. But I somehow was still alive. Then he ripped part of my face. Pain was infernal. I felt everything inside of me tearing apart, dying, leaving me. 
Every single moment was unbearably long. Until finally, after another wave of pain, a moment of bliss has come, I passed away. Marcus was going to be late. He couldn't afford that. He would have to wait until sunset to get the picture he wanted. He didn't have that long. The pilot told him to get back as soon as the sunrise ended or it's an extra charge. Since he doesn't make near enough money to warrant that, he runs. The desert is draped in thick, dull orange in the long shadows cast by cacti and boulders over sand-smooth hills. The sun isn't yet peeking over the horizon, but it will soon, and he needs to be in just the right spot. Dead center of where it will rise. He took all of the measurements, checked the weather to make sure it wouldn't be overcast, wouldn't be a cloud in the sky, and made a point of scheduling the plane to take off from that little rundown airport before sunrise. He planned everything. Everything except the extra half hour he slept in. His foot slid out from under him as he ran, putting him halfway into a split before he righted himself and continued uphill. He swore passionately under out loud, a steady stream of fuck. Fuck! Fuck! that echoed off the cascading rolls of the barren wastes that he was so feverishly trekking through. When he gets up to the top of the hill he's panting, and when he turns around, his heart flutters with joy. The sun is still down. He has a chance. He positions himself flat on his stomach, ignoring the sensation of dry, still freezing sand getting under the seams of his clothes, and raises his camera up so he can see through it. It's blurry blurry, then it is clear just as the sun rolls up in front of him. It is swollen huge and colored a deep reddish orange that glints off of the shimmering, distant landscape. It paints the wasteland a warm, glowing orange and elongates the shadow of every standing thing within it. He snaps the photo. He snaps another. He snaps ten of the fucking things because every passing second produces a greater result. Every photo is money, every speck of detail a dollar sign in his mind. It's gorgeous out here and no one would want to come see it in person so they hire him. They'll get their money's worth alright, no doubt about it. By the time the sunrise ends he's snapped 22 pictures in total, so when he stands up he's ready to leave when something groans behind him. Something metal. His stomach drops and a million possibilities run through his mind in the span of time it takes to turn himself around. Wild animal. Wild local. Tribe of savages. Herd of beasts. The pilot deciding he wants more money. No thought made with rationale and logic in mind, but still more realistic than the sight that actually did greet him. A submarine. An enormous pill shaped behemoth of steel sat at the bottom of the hill behind him. It was caked in rust that ran the color rainbow of shit brown to blood red to pitch black. It was listed a quarter sideways, half sunk into the ground, and Marcus could see sand running off of the jetting tower hatch like dribbling water. He blinked. He blinked again. His mind drew a blank as the frigid night air slowly morphed into a dry, angry heat around him. That shouldn't be here. He mumbled to himself. He stood there for half a minute more before his brain abruptly lit up with inspiration. He raised his camera up and snapped a photo of the rusted metal thing before him. What's a little side project? Someone's bound to get a kick out of this. The pilot can wait a few more minutes. He snaps another picture as he makes his way down toward it. Snaps another. It looked somehow smaller as he got closer, though not by much. When he gets to level footing with the thing, it lets loose another metal groan that stops Marcus dead in his tracks. He sidesteps around it, cautious enough to give it a wide berth for fear of being crushed. The tower with the hatch on top of it looms large above him. He snaps a picture before taking notice that, from where he stands at least, it appears that the hatch is open. What's the harm in checking it out? The pilot can wait a few more minutes. The hull of the submarine was close enough to the ground that he could leap up and pull himself on with his upper body. 
He wipes his hands free of any residue that might have gotten on them. He takes great care to keep balanced as he walks toward the submarine hatch. It is open, and, for the first time on this excursion, Marcus hesitates. The hatch is all the way open, and he can smell something foul wafting out from inside, like moist garbage. The sun is relentless on his back as he stands there, debating himself. It serves as a point and a counterpoint for either of his internal arguments. Go back to the pilot. It's too hot for this. Go inside the sub and out of the sun. Marcus pinches his nose that the rank odor the sub is producing. It's not any sort of fear he feels, hardly even apprehension. He just doesn't want to think about how bad the smell would be inside of the thing. He just about turns around when a new thought hits him. The thought of Johnny Brennan, the smug prick, getting his grease mitts on photos of the inside, taking the credit. Stealing credit from Marcus. Again! He grits his teeth and turns back to the submarine's entryway. He's racked with coughing first as he leers down into the dark rusted hole. He points his camera down towards it and takes a picture, flash on. It illuminates a discolored ladder. The brown red walls of the inside. The floor inside. Nothing noteworthy so Marcus, in an ill-timed fit of unwarranted peak, descended that ladder and found himself surrounded by darkness on all sides. The pilot can wait a few more minutes. He turns behind himself as soon as his feet hit the metal grating of the floor, which echoes inside of the landlocked vessel. He snaps a picture. It illuminates a rust-soaked wall. He turns to his right and snaps a picture. It illuminates a corridor. A row of doors, two on the left and one on the right. What he thought might be some kind of cafeteria at the far end. He faces the opposite way and snaps a picture. It illuminates another corridor. A row of doors, two on the right and one on the left. Someone holding a short-handled machete, standing dead center. Before Marcus can move, or react with the appropriate amount of panic, the sound of echoing footfall starts up. In front and behind him. He starts scrambling, his camera jostling around his neck with a weight that may as well have been that of a noose as he grabbed a ladder rung in each hand, beginning to climb. He's not even two feet off the ground before bodies descend upon him on both sides. He screams at the top of his lungs as his attempts to swing at them result only in his arms being grabbed in strong hands. When he sees those hands he screams so loud he goes hoarse. The men grabbing him are pallid and near skeletal, those who still possess all of their skin at least. The two grabbing him offer Marcus the only glimpse he'll ever of his killers. They are dressed in military fatigues and their faces are visibly decayed, green and black with rot and death. They are without eyes in their half flayed skulls and their lips are shredded to the point of non-existence. The only lights in their heads are green pinpricks deep inside the dark caverns of their eye sockets. One of them, one that he can't see, puts a knife in his gut while he registers this. Marcus feels a sharp, blistering wave of agony melt all of his resistance as the rest envelop him, blocking his view of the sunlight and clear blue sky they are dragging him away from. More blades enter and exit his body. No one place is spared from the onslaught. He can still vaguely see silhouettes of these monstrous things, and, through the haze of pain consuming him, he can feel gripping fingers of sharpened bone rip away the last bits of stringy flesh blocking them from their prize. He can feel them dislodging his coiled intestines, and, in the dim light of the submarine, he can see those same intestines being yanked with great force from his stomach cavity. Suddenly, sight leaves him, and a new pressure makes itself apparent over his bulging, desperate eyes. Greater pressure pops his eyeballs like particularly juicy grapes, sparing him the sight of his attackers shoving his red steaming guts into their lipless mouths. He is not spared the feeling of it, not until he passed out much, 
much later. The pilot would wait much more than a few minutes, 